Hello, this is Susan Elliott, the News and Special Reports Editor of Musical America. Today we are speaking with James Ginsberg. James is the founder and CEO of Sedi Recordings. It is completely artist driven and commercial considerations are not driving sales as they would be in a commercial label. To date, James has issued 200 recordings. Uh, many of them have been nominated for Grammys. Several have won Grammy awards and virtually all of them are resourcefully curated in the sense that they are quite interesting to listen to. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. And uh, I, first of all, want to congratulate you. I've just been speaking up about CD and I see that you have many Grammy awards <laughs> Grammy nominations, and you've had the good the good sense to record many Musical America artists of the year, <laughs> Jenny Coe and Pacifica Quartet and Ace Blackbird and all those great people. So let's start at the beginning here with you as the offspring of two rather prominent lawyers, mm -hmm. uh, one of whom was my all-time hero, um, along with everybody else. You started you went to law school or you started to go to law school. Right. Why the recording business? Why, what got you, what, how did you get the bug sure. start? Well, I mean, I've always been a music lover. Um, and, and particularly, uh, I mean, I started collecting recordings at age seven. Uh, I did some work in the industry. I worked for none such records for a summer. I did some work in music PR, I reviewed recordings for American Record Guide for a number of years. I ran the classical format for the campus radio station at the University of Chicago when I was an undergraduate there. But what really gave me the idea to start a label was something I noticed as an undergraduate, which was, this is now in the mid 1980s, I would go to concerts featuring local artists or hear them perform uh, on the live um, series from WFMT, our wonderful radio station. And then I go to Rose Records, which was the big record store in Chicago those days, and look for their recordings. And coming from New York, I just figured, you know, you hear an artist in concert, you go to the record store, and there would be a bunch of recordings. Well, actually, there weren't. Other than the <laughs> Chicago Symphony uh, with George, George Schulte back then, basically none of the classical music activity in Chicago was being recorded. Uh, and I thought, well, somebody should be recording all these wonderful artists I'm hearing in concerts. So with my background and happening, happening to know a really wonderful recording engineer who was working part time at FMT then, I knew him back. He worked with me on the campus radio station. Right. I got the idea of just starting with one recording. Um, we chose the wonderful Russian emigre pianist Dmitry Paperno for that. Um, and then I started approaching some other artists I knew, uh, like Easley Blackwood at the University of Chicago, David Schrader, who's the wonderful continuo uh, player uh, on, you name it, harpsichord, forte, piano, organ, all, uh, pretty much in every ensemble around town. Uh, and quickly, uh, the label developed a reputation such that artists started coming to me. Uh, in the meantime, I decided that I was much happier producing recordings than going to law school. So by 90, I had started, I had started both law school and essentially putting out recordings in 89. By 91, the label had become a full-time venture. And by 94, we were able to take it uh, nonprofit, as you mentioned. Right. Um, and then the whole gamut of, you know, classical recording activity became available to me, uh, whether it be symphonies or choruses or even operas uh, and everything in between. Yeah. So people come to you mm -hmm. or or and or do you also seek them out or how does that work typically not although if there's an artist who's like new in town or something i might let them make sure they know about our work but right. uh, we really operate as a resource for the artists and, and we're very well known in the in the you know the musical the artistic right. community so right. artists come to me with their with their passions their project ideas and uh, and we get to you know frankly release the best of them which is a really wonderful position to be in how do you do that? I mean, how do you raise the money? Do you raise the money for specific projects or is it more of a kind of a general fund or how does that work? 
Well, really all of the above. So probably most of our fundraising is general operating, whether it be from individuals or foundations, or we get some government support from the city and the state as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have an annual gala each year, which brings in probably the biggest pot of, of all. Um, but we also get uh, project specific support and you know nothing is better than when you can line up a donor with uh, something they're really interested in or an artist they're interested in or repertoire they're particularly excited about. Uh, you know, we're always happy to make those connections. And then more, most recently, um, you know, we noticed that, uh, and you probably noticed this too, that vocal recording has become less and less in the industry, partly because it doesn't stream particularly well. You know, as, a, yeah. as somebody who uh, votes in the Grammys, I've noticed that while there's still lots of recordings to vote on in the chamber music and the uh, solo uh, uh, artist categories, when you get to the solo vocal and the opera, there's not nearly as many. Right. Uh, I think this is still a very important, you know, area to be to be recorded and artists who really need to get their names out there. And it also, of course, vocal music happened to be a great passion of my mother's. Mm -hmm. So at our gala last year, which happened to fall on the second anniversary of her passing, we launched something called the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Fund for vocal recordings, uh, through which we've now raised over $200,000, specifically mm -hmm. for vocal projects, which I think is going to be really important. Great, great. And those vocal project art projects, are they specific to um, artists or are they specific to repertoire or both? Uh, both really. I mean, we're recording a lot of solo artists. Uh, this summer I'm recording albums, for example, with Will Leverman, which will be his second uh, right. album for CD. Uh, and he's of course a very important artist in Chicago. Right. Um, Ian Kojara, a young tenor from Chicago, um, who actually came through the Met program, but he's from here and still resides here between gigs. He's He is the held in tenor of the future, by the way, and we're really excited to be doing an album of very late romantic uh, repertoire with him this summer as well. Mm -hmm. Also, when a, you know, when a company like Haymarket Opera calls me up and says, hey, we're going to do uh, this opera of the Chevalier de Saint-Georges that's never been recorded before, uh, that's right. obviously a, a repertoire decision, and, and, and I was actually you know, in the discussions about with them about, okay, uh, who would be ideal for this cast for not only the performances, but for the recording. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a working relationship with Nicole Cabell from previous Sadie albums, for example. Uh, so yeah. Both, so that answers, both. that answers my question about the degree to which you get involved, not only as the producer, but also as the um, sort of A&R guy Interesting <laughs> and um, that sort of thing, yeah? Well, yeah, I mean, from the start of the label, um, pretty much it was just me and artists would come to me with their ideas and uh, and sometimes I would negotiate a little bit on repertoire or I'd say, you know, give me a few different project ideas and I'll tell you which one I think, you know, uh, will be of the most interest to listenership and potentially to your career, et cetera. Uh, at this point, we get a lot of proposals. Uh, one year, right. we we, ca we um, counted about 50. And, you know, we put out about eight, eight records a year. So uh, I now have uh, actually a committee on my board, which is chaired by Henry Fogel, who used to be the uh, president of the Chicago Symphony, called my Artistic Advisory Committee. And they actually help me now uh, um, get through some of the, you know, the, the submissions. We also have created, uh, and you can find it on the bottom of our website and on all the pages, so... Uh, there's a link that says submit a proposal and we ask all artists, right. even maybe veterans, to use the same form so we can really compare apples to apples when when people are proposing projects. Right. Do you have any plans to um, to grow from eight a year? We already have, frankly. Um, I think uh, last year we put out uh, 10 when you count the one digital. So we had like nine physical album releases and one digital album release as well. So we will right. probably get nine again. Right. This and are year. you it as far as producers go? No, definitely not. I mean, I produce the lion's share for sure. Yeah. But um, there are certain artists who have certain producers they like to work with. Also, um, some of the reper the more contemporary repertoire is uh, not exactly my specialty. And it is there are other producers who do it particularly well. Mm -hmm. So when, when uh, like, like um, Third Coast Percussion has a good relationship with someone like Elaine Martone, they work with her. Right. Jenny Coe has a great relationship with Judy Sherman. 
Um, mm -hmm. so she works with, with her. You know, it depends on the project, depends on the artist. Let's talk a little bit about how the money works. Do, do the artists ever invest in their own recordings? Do they bring money to you or to the no, recording? No, really, that's, uh, so our model is to really allow the artists to work on the music, on, on what they what they want, want to concentrate on. Sometimes artists will help us by identifying donors who are interested in what they're doing. Right. Uh, but we, we don't really ask the artists uh, to raise money themselves. Uh, we that's you know we we have a, de a development department and uh, and you know depending on the album there's some albums that are obvious uh, candidates for funding from various foundations or even some individuals uh, there are others where we say okay there's not really a funding source for this project but it's an important enough project that we'll take do it out of general operating and now of course we have this fund that specifically for vocal music which is going to help a lot. So uh, what about streaming? I, I see that you can, I, I can stream a uh, recording from directly from your website or I can go to Spotify or. So well, you can, you, you, I mean, you can get a link to streaming from our website. We've never been directly in the streaming business for, for a while we were doing selling downloads directly from our website and two, we had MP3 downloads. And then for the folks who wanted the super high end audio, we had something called flack files, which were absolutely gigantic and, I remember for if you wanted the Pacifica Quartet's uh, Shostakovich box set, you you had to do twenty four separate downloads. Oh, in high res format. Yeah, so yeah, got to be a bit much. Um, so we link to streaming sites, but we we only sell physical uh, CDs directly through, through our website. Physical CDs, but, but we're but we're on all the platforms, uh, and not, we have Noxos of America is our is our is our distributor um, physically and digitally. And then there, and then the Noxos um, uh, has, has international distribution through uh, something called Noxos Global Logistics that gets us into, you know, over 60 countries around the world. And then with the artists, uh, depending on the situation, we pay artists either an upfront fee or a royalty on sales, or sometimes some combination of the two in general, uh, when it's a featured artist, uh, I actually prefer to pay royalties because I want them to be invested in the in the marketing of their of their album, and that's obviously right. a good incentive. Uh, when it's somebody who's who's you know a quote unquote side player, you know, uh, yeah, let's say you're doing a, an album with with a string quartet and there's an additional instrument, a quintet. Usually, the the quintet player is going to be paid a, a you know one time fee for joining them on that on that uh, on that uh, track or whatever it is. Interesting. And and do you, as a label, do you commission new pieces, new work? Rarely. I can give one great example, though. Um, uh, when uh, we were planning an album with clarinetist uh, Anthony McGill, who's you know, from Chicago, now principal of the New York Philharmonic, and his brother, the flutist Damari McGill, who's principal of um, Seattle Symphony, we we're planning a duo concertos album with the Chicago Youth Symphony, which they were both principals of, you know, growing up in Chicago, right. and it just happened that we were doing this right when the League of American Orchestras was um, um, having their convention in, in town. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to have, provide an opportunity for these performers uh, to perform in the orchestra hall showcase for the, for the, uh, for the League, uh, uh, could, especially if it was a world premiere, uh, and normally we we work with Chicago composers, but we made an exception in this case for somebody we thought would be particularly appropriate to the project uh, and who we knew could write something good fast. So uh, we had worked with Michael Michael Labels uh, a couple times before. <laughs> so he wrote this one piece called Wing Creatures for the two of them in the orchestra, and that got and and that was a rare case where Sadie actually paid the commission itself. What's more typical, and this would it's always with Chicago composers is we will um, match up a donor with, with the composer. Um, and the way it works is the donor actually makes a contribution to CD and gets a nice tax deduction. We then commission the piece for, from the composer uh, with, uh, and, and our benefit is we get the right to make the first recording of the piece. So we've done that on a number of cases, occasions with a number of different Chicago composers. Interesting. Any plans to uh, 
expand outside of Chicago or do you plan to remain? No, the, I mean, the mission of the label is, I mean, it's what makes us unique is we're the you know, only label devoted specifically to the classical musicians of a specific metropolitan area. And, you know, we don't need to look at Chicago. We have so many. Right, right. Uh, that said, the key is that every project has to have a Chicago basis. So, you know, not everything about a project has to be uh, Chicago. We did an album with Thomas Hampson, for example, but it was all Chicago composers. Uh, Got it. Okay. And, you know, and some of our artists, while they, you know, were born and bred here, ha are currently based uh, in other places, uh, especially in New York, like Anthony McGill, like Jennifer Coe. Um, so, so, you know, it, it varies, but there's always a Chicago basis uh, to every project. They got to have Chicago cred, right? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's <laughs> going to have to move to Chicago if you want to get recorded by Sidney. Well, it's funny Sidil. you say that. Um, uh, I, ho I hope I won't mind me telling this tale. Um, Will Liverman at one point uh, was considering uh, moving to Philadelphia and changed his mind and and decided to stay in Chicago. And I should I should back this up by saying we were recording his uh, Dreams of a New Day, his CD debut album that got a Grammy nomination. Um, right. at the time and we were actually recording it in indiana because this was at the height of the pandemic and chicago was insisting that people coming from other states had to quarantine if the other state had a higher covid rate and will's pianist was from south carolina which back then had a very high covid rate oh yeah so we found a lovely hall in indiana which we knew because we'd also recorded uh um the dover quartet there and uh and also Gaudete Brass, a brass quintet there uh, at the, the music school in Goshen, Indiana is a really terrific concert hall. So as I was driving Will back and forth from our hotel to the sessions, um, I asked him about this. I said, uh, why did you decide to stay in Chicago? And he said, you. He said, wow. being on board for CD was a major factor in deciding to, to stay put. Goodness gracious. I'm very, I, I'm pretty proud of them. <laughs> you should be, yeah. yeah. What do you think we need to be thinking about as as an industry in terms of not just recording, but what what do we need to be working on? Well, I mean, one of the not really secrets of Sadie's success is that the artists that record for us, they propose their own projects. I sometimes help curate a little bit, but uh, but they propose what they're passionate about. Uh, one artist said to me, you know, um, we go to other labels when they call us. When we have an idea of our own, we call you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because I will be receptive to ideas that, you know, frankly, other labels might think are a little out there. Um, but, you know, what to me is most important is that the artists are doing the stuff that they're really passionate about. And and that's what really attracts people. Um, you know, a lot of organizations, I think, turned uh, conservative after the pandemic. You know, I don't know how many opera companies decided all of a sudden it was time to do Carmen again. Uh <laughs> Not that I don't love Carmen, but right. what really got people interested? Uh, fire shut up in my bones, right? Uh, which Will Liverman, of course, uh, um, starred in, both at right. the and here at Lyric. Um, Will Liverman co-wrote an opera of his own, uh, sort of an updated Barbara Seville called uh, The Factotum, right. uh, which mixed uh, different musical genres. Lyric sold out that show every single night. Really? I mean, this, I mean, and, and and it was a wonderfully young and diverse audience coming to that show too. And it was, but it was part, it, it was, it was a combination. It wasn't just classical music, right? He sure, did, wasn't sure. his collaborator a hip hop guy or. That's right. I mean, I said it was a mix of mu musical genres, but, right. but it was exciting. 